and this is the Martian Chronicles Part 4. September 2036, The Martian. The Blue Mountains lifted into the rain, and the rain fell down into the long canals, and old Lafarge and his wife came out of their house to watch. First rain this season, Lafarge pointed out. It's good, said his wife. Very welcome. They shut the door. Inside, they warmed their hands at the fire. They shivered. In the distance, through the window, they saw rain gleaming on the sides of the rocket which had brought them from Earth. There's only one thing, said Lafarge, looking at his hands. What's that? asked his wife. Wish we could have brought Tom with us. Oh, now, Leif. I won't start again. I'm sorry. We came here to enjoy our old age in peace, not to think of Tom. He's been dead so long now. We should try to forget him and everything on Earth. You're right, he said, and turned his hands again to the heat. He gazed into the fire. I won't speak of it any more. It's just I miss driving out to Green Lawn Park every Sunday to put flowers on his marker. It used to be our only excursion. Blue rains fell gently upon the house. Nine o'clock they went to bed and lay quietly, hand in hand, he fifty-five, she sixty, in the raining darkness. Anna, he called softly. Yes, she replied. Do you hear something? They both listened to the rain and the wind. Nothing, she said. Someone whistling, he said. No, I didn't hear it. I'm going to get up and see anyhow. He put on his robe and walked through the house to the front door. Hesitating, he pulled the door wide and rain fell cold upon his face. The wind blew. The dooryard stood a small figure. Lightning cracked the sky and a wash of white color illumined the face looking in at old Lafarge there in the doorway. Who's there? called Lafarge, trembling. No answer. Who is it? What do you want? Still not a word. He felt very weak and tired and numb. Who are you? he cried. His wife entered behind him and took his arm. Why are you shouting? A small boy is standing in the yard and won't answer me, said the old man, trembling. He looks like Tom. Come to bed, you're dreaming. But he's there, see for yourself. He pulled the door wider to let her see. The cold wind blew and the thin rain fell upon the soil. The figure stood looking at them with distant eyes. The old woman held to the doorway. Go away, she said, waving one hand. Go away. Doesn't it look like Tom? asked the old man. The figure did not move. I'm afraid, said the old woman. Lock the door and come to bed. I won't have anything to do with it. She vanished, moaning to herself into the bedroom. The old man stood with the wind raining coldness on his hands. Tom, he called softly. Tom, if that's you, by some chance it is you, Tom. I'll leave the door unlatched, and if you're cold and want to come in to warm yourself, just come in later and lie by the hearth. There's some fur rugs there. He shut but did not lock the door. His wife felt him return to bed and shuddered. It's a terrible night. I feel so old, she said, sobbing. Hush, hush. He gentled her, gentled her and held her in his arms. Go to sleep. After a long while, she slept. And then, very quietly, as he listened, he heard the front door open, the rain and wind come in, the door shut. He heard soft footsteps on the hearth and gentle breathing. Tom, he said to himself, lightning struck in the sky and broke the blackness apart. In the morning, the sun was very hot. <clears throat> Mr. Lafarge opened the door into the living room and glanced all about quickly. The hearth rugs were, hearth rugs were empty. Lafarge sighed. I'm getting old, he said. He went out to walk to the canal to fetch a bucket of clear water to wash in. At the front door, he almost knocked young Tom down, carrying in a bucket already filled to the brim. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Tom. The old man fell aside. The young boy, barefooted, hurried across the room, set the bucket down, and turned, smiling. It's a fine day. Yes, it is, said the old man incredulously. The boy acted as if nothing was unusual. He began to wash his face with the water. The old man moved forward. Tom, how did you get here? You're alive? Shouldn't I be? The boy glanced up. But Tom, Green Lawn Park, every Sunday, the flowers and the farge had to sit down. The boy came and stood before him and took his hand. The old man felt the fingers warm and firm. You're really here. It's not a dream. You do want me to be here, don't you? The boy seemed worried. Yes, yes, Tom. Then why ask questions? Accept me. 
but your mother, the shock. Don't worry about her. During the night, I sang to both of you, and you'll accept me more because of it, especially her. I know what the shock is. Wait till she comes, you'll see. He laughed, shaking his head of coppery curled hair. His eyes were very blue and clear. <clears throat> Good morning, Leif. Tom. Mother came from the bedroom, putting her hair up into a bun. Isn't it a fine day? Tom turned to laugh in his father's face. You see, they ate a very good lunch, all three of them, in the shade behind the house. Mrs. Lafarge had found an old bottle of sunflower wine she'd put away. They all had a drink of that. Mr. Lafarge had never seen his wife's face so bright. If there was any doubt in her mind about Tom, she didn't voice it. It was a completely natural thing to her. It was also becoming natural to Lafarge himself. When Mother cleared the dishes, Lafarge leaned toward his son and said, confidentially, how old are you now, son? Don't you know, father? Fourteen, of course. Who are you, really? You can't be Tom, but you are someone. Who? Don't. Startled, the boy put his hands to his face. You can tell me, said the old man. I'll understand. You're a Martian, aren't you? I've heard tales of the Martians, nothing definite. Stories about how rare Martians are. When they come among us, they come as Earthmen. There's something about you. You're Tom, and yet you're not. Why can't you accept me and stop talking, cried the boy. His hands completely shielded his face. Don't doubt. Please don't doubt me. He turned and ran from the table. Tom, come back. The boy ran off along the canal towards the distant town. Where's Tom going? asked Anna, returning from more dishes. She looked at her husband's face. Did you say something to bother him? Anna, he said, taking her hand. Anna, do you remember anything about Green Lawn Park, a marker, and Tom having pneumonia? What are you talking about? She laughed. Never mind, he said quietly. The distance, the dust drifted down after Tom had run along the canal rim. At five in the afternoon with the sunset, Tom returned. He looked doubtfully at his father. Are you going to ask me anything? He wanted to know. No questions, said Lafarge. The boy smiled his white smile. <clears throat> Great. Where have you been? Near the town. I almost didn't come back. I was almost, the boy sought for a word, trapped. How do you mean trapped? I passed a small tin house by the canal and I was almost made so I couldn't come back here ever again to see you. I don't know how to explain it to you. There's no way. I can't tell you. Even I don't know. It's strange. I don't want to talk about it. We won't then. Better wash up, boy. Supper time. The boy ran. Perhaps ten minutes later, a boat floated down the serene surface of the canal. A tall, lank man with black hair pulling it along with leisurely drives of his arms. Evening, Brother Lafarge, he said, pausing at his task. Evening, Saul. What's the word? All kinds of words tonight. You know that fellow named Normaland who lives down the canal in the tin hut? Lafarge stiffened. Yes. You know what sort of rascal he was? Rumor had it he left Earth because he killed a man. Saul leaned on his wet pole, gazing at Lafarge. Remember the name of the man he killed? Gillings, wasn't it? Right, Gillings. Well, about two hours ago, Mr. Noblin came running to town, crying about he had seen Gillings alive here on Mars today, this afternoon. He tried to get the jail to lock him up safe. The jail wouldn't. So Noblin went home, and 20 minutes ago, as I get the story, blew his brains out with a gun. I just came from there. <clears throat> well, well, said Lafarge. The damnedest things happen, said Saul. Well, good night, Lafarge. Good night. The boat drifted on down the serene canal waters. Supper's hot, called the old woman. Mr. Lafarge sat down to his supper, knife in hand, looked over at Tom. Tom, he said, what did you do this afternoon? Nothing, said Tom, his mouth full. Why? Just wanted to know. The old man tucked his napkin in. At seven that night, the old woman wanted to go to town. Haven't been there in months, she said, but Tom desisted. I'm afraid of the town, he said. The people. I don't want to go there. Such talk for a grown boy, said Anna. I won't listen to it. You'll come along. I say so. Anna, if the boy doesn't want to, started the old man. There was no arguing. She hustled them into the canal boat and they floated up the canal under the evening stars. Tom lying on his back, his eyes closed, 
Asleep or not, there was no telling. The old man looked at him steadily, wondering. Who is this, he thought, in need of love as much as we? Who is he, and what is he, that out of loneliness he comes into the alien camp and assumes the voice and face of memory and stands among us, accepted and happy at last? From what mountain, what cave, what small last race of people remaining on this world when the rockets came from Earth? The old man shook his head. There was no way to know. This, to all purposes, was Tom. The old man looked at the town ahead and <clears throat> did not like it, but then he returned to thoughts of Tom and Anna again, and he thought to himself, perhaps this is wrong to keep Tom, but a little while, when nothing can come of it but trouble and sorrow. How are we to give up the very thing we've wanted, no matter if it stays only a day and is gone, making the emptiness emptier, the dark nights darker, the rainy nights wetter, might as well force the food from our mouths as take this one from us. And he looked at the boy slumbering so peacefully at the bottom of the boat. The boy whimpered with some dream. The people, he murmured in his sleep, changing and changing, the trap. <clears throat> there, there, boy. The farge stroked the boy's soft curls and Tom ceased. The farge helped woman and son, wife and son from the boat. Here we are. Anna smiled at all the lights, listening to the music from the drinking houses the pianos, the photographs, the phonographs, watching people arm in arm striding by in the crowded streets. I wish I was home, said Tom. You never talked that way before, said the mother. You always liked Saturday nights in town. Stay close to me, whispered Tom. I don't want to get trapped. Anna overheard. Stop talking that way. Come along. Lafarge noticed that the boy held his hand. Lafarge squeezed it. I'll stick with you, Tommy boy. He looked at the throngs coming and going, and it worried him also. We won't stay long. Nonsense. We'll spend the evening, said Anna. They crossed the street, and three drunken men careened into them. There was much confusion, a separation, a wheeling about, and Lafarge stood stunned. Tom was gone. Where is he? asked Anna irritably, him always running off any chance he gets. Tom, she called. Mr. Lafarge hurried through the crowd, but Tom was gone. He'll come back. He'll be at the boat when we leave, said Anna, certainly, steering her husband back toward the motion picture theater. There was a sudden commotion in the crowd, and a man and woman rushed by Lafarge. He recognized them, Joe Spaulding and his wife. They were gone before he could speak to them. Looking back anxiously, he purchased the tickets for the theater, allowed his wife to draw him into the unwelcome darkness. Tom was not at the landing at 11 o'clock. Mrs. Lafarge turned very pale. Now, mother, said Lafarge, don't worry. I'll find him. Wait here. Hurry back. The voice faded into the ripple of the water. He walked through the night streets, hands in pockets. All about lights were going out, one by one. A few people were still leaning out their windows. The night was warm, even though the sky still had storm clouds from time to time among the stars. As he walked, he recalled the boy's constant references to being trapped. His fear of crowds and cities. There was no sense in it, thought the old man tiredly. Perhaps the boy was gone forever. Perhaps he'd never been. Lafarge turned in at a particular alley, watching the numbers. Hello there, Lafarge. A man sat in his doorway, smoking a pipe. Hello, Mike. You and your woman quarrel? You out walking it off? No, just walking. Look like you lost something. Speaking of lost things, said Mike, Somebody got found this evening. You know Joe Spaulding? Remember his daughter, Lavinia? Yes, Lafarge was cold. It all seemed a repeated dream. He knew which words would come next. Lavinia came home tonight, said Mike, smoking. You recall she was lost on the Dead Sea Bottoms about a month ago? They found what they thought was her body, badly deteriorated. Ever since the Spaulding family has been no good. Joe went around saying she wasn't dead. That wasn't really her body. Guess he was right. Tonight, Lavinia showed up. Where? The fart felt his breath come swiftly, his heart pounding. On Main Street. The Spaldings were buying tickets for a show. There, all of a sudden, in the crowd, was Lavinia. Must have been quite a scene. She didn't know them first off. They followed her halfway down the street and spoke to her. Then she remembered. Did you see her? No, no but I heard her singing. Remember how she used to sing the Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond? I heard her trilling out for her father a while ago over there in their house. It was good to hear her such a beautiful girl. Shame I thought her dead. 
Now with her back, now with her back again, it's fine. Here now, you look weak yourself. Better come in for a spot of whiskey. Thanks, no Mike. The old man moved away. Heard Mike say good night and did not answer. Fixed his eyes upon the two-story building where rambling clusters of crimson Martian flowers lay upon the high crystal roof. Around back above the garden was a twisted iron balcony. The windows above were lighted. It was very late and still he thought to himself, what will happen to Anna if I don't bring Tom home with me? The second shock, the second death, what will it do to her? Will she remember the first death too, in this dream, in the sudden vanishing? Oh God, I got to find Tom. What will come of Anna? Poor Anna waiting there at the landing. He paused and lifted his head. Somewhere above, voices bade other soft voices good night. Doors turned and shut, lights dimmed, the gentle singing continued. A moment later, a girl no more than 18, very lovely, came out upon the balcony. The farge called up through the wind that was blowing. The girl turned and looked down. Who's there? she cried. It's me, said the old man, and realizing this reply to be silly and strange, fell silent, his lips working. Should he call out? Tom, my son, this is your father. How to speak to her? She would think him quite insane and summon her parents. The girl bent forward in the blowing light. I know you, she replied softly. Please go. There's nothing you can do. You gotta come back. He escaped Lafarge before he could prevent it. The moonlit figure above drew it into shadow, so there was no identity, only a voice. I'm not your son anymore, it said. We should never have come to town. Anna's waiting at the landing. I'm sorry, said the quiet voice. What can I do? I'm happy here. I'm loved, even as you love me. I am what I am when I take what can be taken. Too late now. They've caught me. But Anna, the shock to her. Think of that. The thoughts are too strong in this house. It's like being imprisoned. I can't change myself back. You are Tom. You were Tom, weren't you? You aren't joking with an old man. You're not really Lafinia Spaulding. I'm not anyone. I'm just myself, wherever I am. I am something, and now I'm something you can't help. You're not safe in the town. It's better out on the canal where no one can hurt you, pleaded the old man. That's true, the voice hesitated. But I must consider these people now. How would they feel if in the morning I was gone again? It's time for good. Anyway, the mother knows what I am. She guessed, even as you did. I think they all guessed, but didn't question. You don't question providence. You can't have the reality. Dream is just as good. Perhaps I'm not their dead one back something almost better to them. Ideal shaped by their minds. I have a choice of hurting them or your wife. They're a family of five. They can stand your loss better. Please, said the voice. I'm tired. The old man's voice hardened. You've got to come. I can't let Anna be hurt again. You're our son. You're my son and you belong to us. No, please. The shadow trembled. You don't belong to this house or these people. No, don't do this to me. Tom, Tom, son, listen to me. Come back. Slip down the vines, boy. Come along. Anna's waiting. We'll give you a good home. Everything you want. He stared and stared upward, willing it to be. The shadows drifted. The vines rustled. At last, the quiet voice said, All right, father. Tom. In the moonlight, the quick figure of a boy slid down through the vines. The farge put up his arms to catch him. The room lights above flashed on. A voice issued from one of the grilled windows. Who's down there? Hurry, boy. More lights, more voices. Stop, I have a gun. Vinny, are you all right? A running of feet. Together, the old man and the boy ran across the garden. A shot sounded. The bullet struck the wall as they slammed the gate. Tom, you that way. I'll go here and lead them off. Run to the canal. I'll meet you there in ten minutes, boy. They parted. The moon hid behind a cloud. The old man ran in darkness. Anna, I'm here. The old woman helped him, trembling into the boat. Where's Tom? He'll be here in a minute, panted Lafarge. They turned to watch the alleys in the sleeping town. Late strollers were still out. A policeman, a night watchman, a rocket pilot, several lonely men coming home from some nocturnal rendezvous. Four men and women issuing from a bar laughing. Music played dimly somewhere. Why doesn't he come? asked the old woman. He'll come. He'll come. Lafar Lafarge was not certain. Suppose, suppose the boy had been caught again, somehow, 
somewhere in his travel down to the landing, running through the midnight streets between the dark houses. It was a long run, even for a young boy. He should have reached here first. Now far away, along the moonlit avenue, a figure ran. Lafarge cried out and then silenced himself, for also far away was another sound of voices and running feet. Lights blazed on in window after window. Across the open plaza leading to the landing, the one figure ran. It was not Tom. It was only a running shape with a face like silver shining in the light of the globes clustered about the plaza. As it rushed nearer, nearer, became more familiar. To when it reached the landing, it was Tom. Anna flung up her hands. Lafarge hurried to cast off. Already, it was too late. For out of the avenue and across the silent plaza now came one man, another, a woman, two other men, Mr. Spaulding, all running. They stopped, bewildered. They stared about, wanting to go back because this could be only be a nightmare. It was quite insane. But they came on again, hesitantly, stopping, starting. It was too late. The night, the event, was over. The farge twisted the mooring rope in his fingers. It was very cold and lonely. People raised and put down their feet in the moonlight, drifting with great speed, wide-eyed, until the crowd, all ten of them, halted at the landing. They peered wildly down into the boat. They cried out, Don't move, Lafarge! Spalding had a gun. And now it was evident what had happened. Tom, flashing through the moonlit streets, alone, passing people. A policeman seeing the figure dart past. The policeman pivoting, staring at the face, calling a name, giving pursuit. You, stop! Seeing a criminal face. All along the way, the same thing. Men here, women there, night watchmen, rocket pilots. The swift figure meaning everything to them. All identities, all persons, all names. How many different names had been uttered in the last five minutes? How many different faces shaped over Tom's face, all wrong? All down the way, they pers the pursuit and the pursuing, the dream and the dreamers, the quarry and the hounds. All down the way, the sudden revealment, the flash of familiar eyes, the cry of an old, old name, the remembrance of other times, the crowd multiplying. Everyone leaping forward is like an image reflected from 10,000 mirrors, 10,000 eyes. The running dream came and went, different face to those ahead, those behind, those yet to be, met those unseen. And here they are, are now at the boat, wanting the dream for their own, just as we want him to be Tom, not Lavinia or William or Roger or any other, thought Lafarge. But it's all done now. The thing has gone too far. Come up, all of you, Spalding ordered them. <clears throat> Tom stepped from the boat. Spalding seized his wrist. You're coming home with me. I know. Wait, said the policeman. He's my prisoner. Name's Dexter, wanted for murder. No, a woman sobbed. It's my husband. I guess I know my husband. Other voices objected. The crowd moved in. Mrs. Lafarge shielded Tom. This is my son. You have no right to accuse him of anything. We're going home right now. As for Tom, he was trembling and shaking violently. He looked very sick. The crowd thickened about him, putting out their wild hands, seizing and demanding. Tom screamed. Before their eyes, he changed. He was Tom and James and a man named Switchman, another named Butterfield. He was the town mayor and the young girl Judith and the husband William and the wife Clarice was melting wax, shaping to their minds. They shouted, they pressed forward, pleading. He screamed, threw out his hands, his face dissolving to each demand. Tom, cried Lafarge. Alice, another. William. They snatched his wrists, whirled him about. With one last shriek of horror, he fell. He lay on the stones, melting wax, cooling. His face all faces, one eye blue, the other golden. Hair that was brown, red, yellow, black. One eyebrow thick, one thin, one hand large, one small. They stood over him and put their fingers to their mouths. They bent down. He's dead, someone said at last. It began to rain. The rain fell upon the people and they looked up at the sky. Slowly and then more quickly, they turned and walked away and then started running, scattering from the scene. In a minute, the place was desolate. Only Mr. and Mrs. Lafarge remained, looking down, hand in hand, terrified. The rain fell upon the upturned, unrecognizable face. Anna said nothing but began to cry. Come along home, Anna. There's nothing we can do, said the old man. They climbed down into the boat and went back along the canal in the darkness. They entered their house and lit a small fire and warmed their hands. 
They went to bed and lay together, cold and thin, listening to the rain return to the roof above them. Listen, said Lafarge at midnight. Did you hear something? Nothing, nothing. I'll go look anyway. He fumbled across the dark room and waited by the outer door for a long time before he opened it. He pulled the door wide and looked out. Rain poured from the black sky upon the empty dooryard, into the canal and among the blue mountains. He waited five minutes, and then softly, his hands wet, he shut and bolted the door. November 2036, the luggage store. It was a very remote thing when the luggage store proprietor heard the news on the night radio, received all the way from Earth on a light sound beam. The proprietor felt how remote it was. It's going to be a war on Earth. He went out to peer into the sky. Yes, there it was, Earth in the evening heavens, following the sun into the hills. The words on the radio and that green star were one and the same. I don't believe it, said the proprietor. It's because you're not there, said Father Peregrine, who had stopped by to pass the time of evening. What do you mean, Father? It's like when I was a boy, said Father Peregrine. We heard about wars in Asia. We never believed them. It was too far away. There were too many people dying. It was impossible. Even when we saw the motion pictures, we didn't believe it. Well, that's how it is now. Earth is Asia. So far away, it's unbelievable. It's not here. You can't touch it. You can't even see it. All you see is a green light. Two billion people living on that light. Unbelievable. Wait, we don't hear the explosions. We will, said the proprietor. I keep thinking about all those people that were going to come to Mars this week. What was it? 100,000 or so coming up in the next month or so? What about them if the war starts? I imagine they'll turn back. They'll be needed on Earth. Well, said the proprietor, better get my luggage dusted off. I got a feeling there'll be a rush sale here any time. Do you think everyone now on Mars will go back to Earth if this is the big war we've all been expecting for years? It's a funny thing, Father, but yes, I think we'll all go back. I know we came up here to get away from things. Politics, the atom bomb, war, pressure groups, prejudice, laws. I know. It's still home there. You wait and see. When the first bomb drops on America, the people up here will start thinking. They haven't been here long enough. A couple years is all. If they'd been here 40 years, it'd be different. You got relatives down there in their hometowns. Me, yeah, I can't believe in Earth anymore. Can't imagine it much. I'm old. I don't count. I might stay on here. I doubt it. Yes, I guess you're right. They stood on the porch watching the stars. Finally, Father Peregrine pulled some money from his pocket and handed it to the proprietor. Come to think of it, better give me a new valise. My old one's in pretty bad condition. November 2036, the off season. Sam Parkhill motioned with a broom, sweeping away the blue Martian sand. Here we are, he said. Yes, sir, look at that, he pointed. Look at that sign, Sam's Hot Dogs. Ain't that beautiful, Elma? Sure, Sam, said his wife. Boy, what a change for me. The boys from the fourth expedition could see me now. Am I glad to be in business myself while all the rest of them guys are off soldiering around still? We'll make thousands, Elma, thousands. His wife looked at him for a long time, not speaking. Whatever happened to Captain Wilder, she asked finally. That captain that killed that guy who thought he was going to kill off every other earth man, what was his name? Spender, that nut. It was too damn particular. Oh, Captain Wilder? He's off on a rocket to Jupiter, I hear. They've kicked him upstairs. I think he was a little batty about Mars, too. Touchy, you know. He'll be back down from Jupiter and Pluto in about 20 years if he's lucky. That's what he gets for shooting off his mouth. Oh, he's freezing to death? Look at me. Look at this place. This was a crossroads where two dead highways came and went in darkness. Here Sam Parkhill had flung up his riveted aluminum structure, garish with white light, traveling with jukebox melody. He stooped to fix the border of broken glass he had placed on the footpath. He had broken the glass from some old Martian buildings in the hills. Best hot dogs on two worlds. First man on Mars with a hot dog stand. Best onions and chili and mustard. Can't say I'm not alert. There's the main highways. Over there is a dead city and the mineral deposits. Those trucks from Earth Settlement 101 will have to pass here 24 hours a day. Do I know my loca locations or don't I? His wife looked at her fingernails. 
Think those 10,000 new type work rockets will come through to Mars, she said at last. In a month, he said loudly. Why, you look so funny. I don't trust those Earth people, she said. I'll believe it when I see them, 10,000 rockets arrive with the 100,000 Mexicans and Chinese on them. Customers, he lingered on the word, 100,000 hungry people. If, if, said his wife slowly, watching the sky, there's no atomic war. I don't trust no atom bombs. There's so many of them on Earth now, you never can tell. Ah, said Sam, and went on sweeping. In the corners of his eyes, he caught a blue flicker. Something floated in the air gently behind him. He heard his wife say, Sam, friend of yours to see you. Sam whirled to see the mask seemingly floating in the wind. So you're back again. Sam held his broom like a weapon. The mask nodded. It was cut from pale blue glass and was fitted above a thin neck and in which were blowing loose robes of thin yellow silk. In the silk, two mesh silver hands appeared. The masked mouth was a slot from which musical sounds issued now as the robes, the mask, the hands increased to a height, decreased. Mr. Parkhill, I've come back to speak to you again, the voice said from behind the mask. I thought I told you I don't want you near here, cried Sam. Go on, I'll give you the disease. I've already had the disease, said the voice. I was one of the few survivors. I was sick a long time. Go on and hide in the hills. That's where you belong. That's where you've been. Why you come on down and bother me? Now, all of a sudden, twice in one day. We mean you no harm. But I mean you harm, said Sam, backing up. I don't like strangers. I don't like Martians. Never seen one before. It ain't natural. All these years you guys hide. All of a sudden you pick on me. Leave me alone. We come for an important reason, said the blue mask. If it's about this land, it's mine. I built this hot dog stand with my own hands. In a way, it is about the land. Look here, said Sam. I'm from New York City. Where I come from, there's 10 million others just like me. You Martians are a couple dozen left. Got no cities. You wander around in the hills. No leaders. No laws. Now you come tell me about this land. The old got to give way to the new. That's the law of give and take. I got a gun here. After you left this morning, I got it out and loaded it. We Martians are telepathic, said the cold blue mask. We are in contact with one of your towns across the Dead Sea. Have you listened to your radio? My radio's busted. Then you don't know. There's big news. It concerns Earth. Silver hand gestured. Bronze tube appeared in it. Let me show you this. A gun, cried Sam Parkhill. Instant later, he had yanked his own gun from his hip holster and fired into the mist, the robe, the blue mask. The mask sustained itself a moment, and like a small circus tent pulling up its stakes and dropping soft, fold on fold, the silks rustled, the mask descended, silver claws tinkled on the stone path. The mask lay on a small huddle of silent white bones and material. Sam stood ga gasping. His wife swayed over the huddled pile. That's no weapon, she said, bending down. She picked up the bronze tube. It was going to show you a message. It's all written out in snake script of the blue snakes. I can't read it, can you? No, that Martian picture writing wasn't anything. Let it go. Sam glanced hastily around. There may be others. We've got to get him out of sight. Get the shovel. What are you going to do? Bury him, of course. You shouldn't have shot him. It was a mistake. Quick. Silently, she fetched him the shovel. Eight o'clock, he was back sweeping the front of the hot dog stand self-consciously. His wife stood, arms folded, in the bright doorway. I'm sorry what happened, he said. He looked at her, then away. You know it was purely the circumstances of fate. Yes, said his wife. I hated like hell to see him take out that weapon. What weapon? Well, I thought it was one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How many times do I say it? Shh, shh, said Alma, putting one finger to her lip. Shh. I don't care, he said. I got the whole Earth Settlement's ink back of me, he snorts. Those Martians won't dare. Look! He looked out onto the Dead Sea bottom. He dropped his broom, picked it up, and his mouth was open. A little free drop of saliva flew on the air, and he was suddenly shivering. Elma, Elma, Elma. Here they come, said Elma. Across the ancient sea floor, a dozen tall, blue sailed Martian sand ships floated like blue ghosts, like blue smoke. Sand ships? But there aren't any more, Elma. No more sand ships. These seem to be sand ships, she said. 
but the authorities confiscated all of them. They broke them up, sold some at auction. I'm the only one in this whole damn territory who's got one and knows how to run one. Not anymore, she said, nodding at the sea. Come on, let's get out of here. Why, she asked slowly, fascinated with the Martian vessels. They'll kill me. Get in our truck quick. Alma didn't move. Had to drag her around back of the stand where the two machines stood, his truck, which he had used steadily until a month ago, the old Martian sand ship, which he had bid for at auction, smiling, which during the last three weeks he had used to carry supplies back and forth over the glassy seafloor. Looked at his truck now and remembered. Engine was out on the ground. Been puttering with it for two days. The truck don't seem to be in running condition, said Alma. The sand ships, get in. Let you drive me in a sand ship? Oh, no. Get in. I can do it. He shoved her in, jumped in behind her, and flapped the tiller at the cobalt sail up, up to take the evening wind. The stars were bright, and the blue Martian ships were skimming across the whispering sands. At first, his own ship would not move, and he remembered the sand anchor and yanked it in. There. The wind hurled the sand ship keening over the dead sea bottom, over long buried crystals, past upended pillars, past deserted docks of marble and brass, past dead white chest cities, past purple foothills, into distance. The figures of the Martian ships receded and then began to pace Sam's ship. Guess I showed them by God, cried Sam. I report to the Rocket Corporation. They give me protection. I'm pretty quick. They could have stopped you if they wanted, Elma said tiredly. They just didn't bother. He laughed. Come off it. Why should they let me get off? Though they weren't quick enough is all. Weren't they? Elma nodded behind him. He did not turn. Felt a cold wind blowing. He was afraid to turn. Felt something in the seat behind him. Something as frail as your breath on a cold morning. Something as blue as hickory wood smoke at twilight. Something like old white lace. Something like a snowfall. Something like the icy rime of winter on the brittle sedge. There was a sound as if of a thin plate of glass broken, laughter, and silence. He turned. The young woman sat at the tiller bench quietly. Her wrists were thin as icicles, her eyes as clear as the moon's and as large, steady, and white. The wind blew at her, and like an image on cold water, she rippled, silk standing out from her frail body in tatters of blue rain. Go back, she said. No! Sam was quivering, the fine, delicate fear quivering of a hornet suspended in the air and decided between fear and hate. Get off my ship! This isn't your ship, said the vision. It's old as our world. Sailed the sand seas ten thousand years ago, when the seas were whispered away, the docks were empty, and you came and took it, stole it. Now, turn it around, go back to the crossroad place. We have need to talk with you. Something important has happened. Get off my ship, said Sam. He took a gun from his holster with a creak of leather. He pointed it carefully. Jump off before I count three, or... Don't, cried the girl. I won't hurt you. Neither will the others. We came in peace. One, said Sam. Sam, said Alma. Listen to me, said the girl. Two, said Sam firmly, cocking the gun trigger. Sam, cried Alma. Three, said Sam. We only, said the girl. The gun went off. In the sunlight, snow melts, crystals evaporate into a steam, into nothing. In the firelight, vapors dance and vanish. In the core of a volcano, fragile things burst and disappear. The girl in the gunfire, in the heat, in the concussion, folded like a soft scarf, melted like a crystal figurine. What was left of her, ice, snowflake, smoke, blew away in the wind. The tiller seat was empty. Sam holstered his gun and did not look at his wife. Sam, she said after a minute more of traveling, whispering over the moon-colored sea of sand, stop the ship. He looked at her and his face was pale. No, you don't. Not after all this time. You're not pulling out on me. She looked at his hand on his gun. I believe you would, she said. You actually would. He jerked his head from side to side, hand tight on the tiller bar. Alma, this is crazy. We'll be in town in a minute. We'll be okay. Yes, said his wife, lying back cold in the ship. Alma, listen to me. There's nothing to hear, Sam. Alma. They were passing a little white chest city. In his frustration, in his rage, he sent six bullets crashing among the crystal towers. The city dissolved in a shower of ancient glass and splintered quartz. Fell away like carved soap, shattered. Was no more. He laughed and fired again. One last tower, one last chess piece, took fire, ignited, 
and Blue Flinders went up to the stars. I'll show them. I'll show everybody. Go ahead. Show us, Sam. She lay in the shadows. Here comes another city. Sam reloaded his gun. Watch me fix it. The blue phantom ships loomed up behind him, drawing steadily a pace. Did not see them at first. It was only aware of a whistling and a high windy screaming as of steel on sand. It was the sound of the sharp razor prows of the sand ships preening the sea bottoms, the red pennants, blue pennants unfurled. The blue light ships were blue dark images, masked men, men with silvery faces, men with blue stars for eyes, men with carved golden ears, men with tin foiled cheeks and ruby studded lips, men with arms folded, men following him, Martian men. One, two, three, Sam counted. The Martian ships closed in. Elma, Elma, I can't hold them all off. Elma did not speak or rise from where she had slumped. Sam fired his gun eight times. One of the sand ships fell apart, the sail, the emerald body, the bronze hull points, the moon-white tiller, all the separate images in it. The masked men, all of them, dug into the sand and separated out into orange and then smoke flame. But the other ships closed in. I'm outnumbered, Elma, he cried. They'll kill me. He threw out the anchor. It was no use. Sail fluttered down, folding onto itself, sighing. The ship stopped. The wind stopped. Travel stopped. Mars stood still as the majestic vessels of the Martians drew around and hesitated over him. Earth man, a voice called from a high seat somewhere. Silvering mask moved. Ruby rimmed lips glittered with the words. I didn't do anything. Sam looked at all the faces, one hundred in all, those that surrounded him. There weren't many Martians left on Mars. One hundred, one hundred and fifty all told. Most of them were here now, on the Dead Seas their resurrected ships, by their dead chest, chest cities, one of which had just fallen like some fragile vase hit by a pebble. The silvery masks glinted. It was all a mistake, he pleaded, standing out of his ship, his wife slumped behind him in the deeps of the hold like a dead woman. I came to Mars like any honest, enterprising businessman. I took some surplus material from a rocket that crashed. I built me the finest little stand you ever saw, right there on that land by the crossroads. You know where it is? You've got to admit it's a good job of building. Sam laughed, staring around. And that Martian, I know he was a friend of yours, came. His death was an accident, I assure you. All I wanted to do was have a hot dog stand. The only one on Mars, the first and most important one. You understand how it is. I was going to serve the best damn hot dogs there with chili and onions and orange juice. Silver masks did not move. They burned in the moonlight. Yellow eyes shone upon Sam felt his stomach clench in, wither, become a rock. He threw his gun in the sand. I give up. Pick up your gun, said the Martians in chorus. What? Your gun. A jeweled hand waved from the prow of a blue ship. Pick it up. Put it away. Unbelieving, he picked up the gun. Now, said the voice, turn your ship and go back to your stand. Now? Now, said the voice. We will not harm you. You ran away before we were able to explain. Come. Now the great ships turned as lightly as moon thistles. The wing sails flapped with a sound of soft applause on the air. The, max, the masks were coruscating, turning, firing the shadows. Elma! Sam tumbled into the ship. Get up, Elma! We're going back! He was excited. He almost gibbered with relief. They aren't going to hurt me. Kill me, Elma. Get up, honey. Get up! What? What? Elma blinked around, and slowly, as the ship was sent into the wind again, she helped herself, as in a dream, back up to a seat and slumped there like a sack of stones, saying no more. The sand slid under the ship. In half an hour, they were back at the crossroads, the ships planted, all of them out of the ships. The leader stood before Sam and Elma, his mask be beaten of polished bronze, the eyes only empty slits of endless blue-black, the mouth a slot out of which words drifted into the wind. Ready, your stand, said the voice. Diamond-gloved hand waved. Prepare the viands. Prepare the foods. Prepare the strange wines. Tonight is indeed a great night. You mean, said Sam, you let me stay on here? Yes. You're not mad at me? The mask was rigid and carved and cold and sightless. Prepare your place of food, said the voice softly, and take this. What is it? Sam blinked at the silver foil, foil scroll that was handed him, upon which, in hieroglyph, snake figures danced. 
It is the land grant to all of the territory from the Silver Mountains to the Blue Hills, the Dead Salt Sea, there to the distant valleys of Moonstone and Emerald, said the leader. M -m Mine, said Sam. Yours. One hundred thousand miles of territory? Yours. Did you hear that, Elma? Elma was sitting on the ground, leaning against the aluminum hot dog stand, eyes shut. Why? Why are you giving me all this? asked Sam, trying to look into the metal slots of the eyes. This is not all. Here. Six other scrolls were produced. The names were declared. The territories announced. Why, that's half of Mars. I own half of Mars. Sam rattled the scrolls in his fists. He shook them at Alma, insane with laughter. Alma, did you hear? I heard, said Alma, looking at the sky. She seemed to be watching for something. She's becoming a little more alert now. Thank you. Oh, thank you, said Sam to the bronze mask. Tonight is the night, said the mask. You must be ready. I will be. What is it? A surprise? Are the rockets coming through earlier than we thought? A month earlier from Earth? All 10,000 rockets bringing the settlers, the miners, the workers, and their wives? All 100,000 of them? Won't that be great, Alma? You see, I told you. I told you that town there won't always have just 1,000 people in it. There'll be 50,000 more coming. A month after that, 100,000 more. By the end of the year, five million Earthmen. And me with the only hot dog stand staked out at the busiest highway to the mines. The mask floated on the wind. We leave you. Prepare. The land is yours. In the blowing moonlight, like metal petals of some ancient flower, like blue plumes, like cobalt butterflies immense and quiet, the old ships turned and moved over the shifting sands, the masks beaming and glittering, to the last shine, the last blue color was lost among the hills. Elma, why did they do it? Why didn't they kill me? Don't they know anything? What's wrong with them? Elma, do you understand? He shook her shoulder. I own half of Mars. She watched the night sky, waiting. Come on, he said. We've got to get the place fixed. All the hot dogs boiling, the buns warm, the chili cooking, the onions peeled and diced, the relish laid out, the napkins in the clips, the place spotless. Hey, he did a little wild dance, kicking his heels. Oh, boy, I'm happy. Yes, sir, I'm happy, he sang off key. This is my lucky day. He boiled the hot dogs, cut the buns, sliced the onions in a frenzy. Just think, that Martian said a surprise. That could only mean one thing, Alma. Those hundred thousand people coming in ahead of schedule, tonight of all nights, will be flooded. We'll work long hours for days, what with tourists riding around seeing things, Alma. Alma, think of the money. He went out and looked at the sky. He didn't see anything. In a minute, maybe, he said, snuffing the cold air gratefully, arms up, beating his chest. Ah, Alma said nothing. She peeled potatoes for french fries quietly, her eyes always on the sky. Sam, she said half an hour later, there it is. Look. He looked and saw it. Earth. It rose full and green like a fine cut stone above the hills. Good old Earth, he whispered lovingly. Good old wonderful Earth. Send me your hungry and your starved. Something, something. How does that poem go? Send me your hungry, old Earth. Here's Sam Parkhill. His hot dogs all boiled. His chili cooking. Everything neat as a pin. Come on, you Earth, send me your rockets. He went out to look at his place. There it sat, perfect as a fresh laid egg on the dead sea bottom, the only nucleus of light and warmth in hundreds of miles of lonely wasteland. Like a heart beating alone in a dark, great dark body. Felt almost sorrowful with pride, gazing at it with wet eyes. Sure makes you humble, he said among the cooking odors of wieners, warm buns, rich butter. Step up, he invited the various stars in the sky. We'll be the first to buy. Sam, said Alma, earth changed in the black sky. It caught fire. Part of it seemed to come apart in a million pieces as if a giant jigsaw had exploded, burned with an unholy dripping glare for a minute, three times normal size, then dwindled. What was that? Sam looked at the green fire in the sky. Earth, said Alma, holding her hands together. That can't be earth. That's not earth. No, that ain't earth. It can't be. You mean it couldn't be Earth, said Alma, looking at him. This just isn't Earth. No, that's not Earth. Is that what you mean? Not Earth. Oh, no, it couldn't be, he wailed. He stood there, his hands at his sides, his mouth open, his eyes wide and dull, not moving. Sam, she called his name. For the first time in days, her eyes were bright. Sam, 
He looked up at the sky. Well, she said. She glanced around for a minute or so in silence. Then briskly, she flapped a wet towel over her arm. Switch on more lights. Turn up the music. Open the doors. There'll be another batch of customers along in about a million years. Gotta be ready. Yes, sir. Sam did not move. What a swell spot for a hot dog stand, she said. She reached over and picked a toothpick out of a jar and put it between her front teeth. Let you in on a little secret, Sam, she whispered, leaning toward him. This looks, this looks like it's going to be an off-season. November 2036, The Watchers. They all came out and looked at the sky that night, left their suppers or their washing up or their dressing for the show, and they came out upon their now not quite as new porches, watched the green star of Earth there. It was a move without conscious effort. They all did it to help them understand the news they had heard on the radio a moment before. There was Earth, and there the coming war. Three hundred of thousands of mothers or grandmothers or fathers or brothers or aunts or uncles or cousins. They stood on the porches, tried to believe in the existence of Earth, much as they had once tried to believe in the existence of Mars. It's a problem reversed. To all intents and purposes, Earth now is dead. They've been away from it for three or four years. Space was an anesthetic. Seventy million miles of space numbed you put memory to sleep, depopulated Earth, erased the past, allowed these people here to go on with their work. But now, tonight, the dead were risen. Earth was re-inhabited. Memory awoke. A million names were spoken. What was so-and-so doing tonight on Earth? What about this one and that one? People on the porches glanced sidewise at each other's faces. At nine o'clock, Earth seemed to explode, catch fire and burn. People on the porches put up their hands as if to beat the fire out. They waited. By midnight, the fire was extinguished. Earth was still there. There was a sigh like an autumn wind from the porches. We haven't heard from Harry for a long time. He's all right. We should send a message to Mother. She's all right. Is she? Now, don't worry. Will she be all right, do you think? Of course. Of course, now come to bed. Nobody moved. Late dinners were carried out onto the night lawns and set upon collapsible tables. They picked these slowly until two o'clock. The light radio message flashed from Earth. They could read the great Morse code flashes, which flickered like a distant firefly. Australian continent atomized in premature explosion of atomic stockpile. Los Angeles, London, bombed. War. Come home. Come home. Come home. They stood up from their tables. Come home. Come home. Come home. Have you heard from your brother Ted this year? You know, with mail rates, five bucks a letter to earth, I don't write much. Come home. I've been wondering about Jane. Remember Jane, my kid sister? Come home. At three in the chilly morning, the luggage store proprietor glanced up. A lot of people were coming down the street. Stayed open late on purpose. What'll it be, mister? By dawn, the luggage was gone from his shelves.